Hi everyone. It is really lovely to see um, so many of you here. Uh, my name is Dana Seitler and I am the director of the Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies. And I see that Mark Bonham himself is here with us tonight. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> um, and uh, welcome to everybody to the seventh annual Queer Directions Symposium uh, with this year's theme, Queer and Trans Visions. Um, I'm really so thrilled to have so many of you with us this afternoon. This is the first time we've been in person in three years, and so we're really, really excited to be here too. Um, I want to thank everybody that has made uh, this event possible. My amazing team at the Bottom Center, Sarah Alim, Elliot Tilichek, and Christopher Smith for all their care and labor putting this event together, um, and Naveen Manai as well. Um, I would also like to thank Martha McCain and the Global Initiatives Fund that allows us to host Queer Directions every year. Um, and I want to thank our wonderful ushers, uh, Sunny and Jesse, that helped everybody find this room tonight. Um, and then uh, finally, I want to thank our four guests for um, being here with us today and sharing your work with us, Bo Ruberg, Julia Chang, Ajamu, and Misha Cardenas. Welcome. I'm going to begin by acknowledging the land we are gathering on today. The University of Toronto, itself a physical and intellectual structure enabled by land theft and the violences of settler colonialism, is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Patoon First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. The Dish with One Spoon Agreement recognizes that we live off the same resources, hence protocols are put in place to ensure mutual respect and accountability to each other and to the land. Today, the meeting place of Toronto or Takaronto is still the home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise a result of colonialism and imperialism. We are all treaty peoples, and we are all responsible for honoring and upholding these agreements. My hope for today is that we gather in the same spirit of these agreements of mutual care and respect. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work on this territory and to share all the space, uh, the space here with you today. Now I'm going to uh, introduce our guests. Um, Dr. Uh, Bo Ruberg is an associate professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies at the University of California, Irvine, and the co-editor of the Journal of Cinema and Media Studies. Their research explores gender and sexuality in digital media and digital cultures. They are the author of three monographs, Video Games Have Always Been Queer, The Queer Games Avant-Garde, How LGBTQ Game Makers Are Reimagining the Medium of Video Games, and Sex Dolls at Sea, Imagine Histories of Sexual Technologies. They are also the editor of Queer Game Studies and Real Life Time in, in Real Time Live Streaming Culture. Shuli Chang is an artist and filmmaker whose work aims to envision genders, genres, and operating structures. Her genre bending, gender hacking practices challenge the existing operating mechanisms and the boundaries imposed on society, geography, politics, and economic structures. As a net art pioneer, her Brandon was the first web art commissioned and collected by the Guggenheim Museum. Her feature length films, Fresh Kill, IKU, and Fluid, I don't know how to pronounce that, zero, um, respectively uh, terms um, eco cybernoia, sci fi cyberpunk, and sci fi cypherpunk seek, seek to define a genre of new queer sci fi cinema. Chang represented Taiwan um, with 3x3x6, a mixed media installation at Venice Biennale 2019. And she is releasing her fourth feature film, UKI, 
at sci-fi viral alt reality cinema. Ajamu is an acclaimed fine art studio based and darkroom led photographic artist working in the UK. His work, theoretical provocations and aesthetics unapologetically celebrate black queer bodies, the erotic, sex, desire, and the politics of pleasure. Maybe that's going to slow down right when I'm saying a sex thing. <laughs> Which is fine by me. His black and white images also pose imagination, fiction, and play in opposition to the constant framing of black queer bodies and nuanced live experiences um, from a sociological framework. His work has been shown in many prestigious museums, galleries, and alternative spaces around the world and has been published in a wide variety of publications and critical journals. In 2022, he co-founded Spit and Spider Press and received an honorary fellowship from the Royal Photographic Society of Great Britain. Misha Cardenas is an artist and associate professor of performance, play, and design and critical race and ethnic studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she directs the Critical Realities Studio. Her book, Poetic Operations, proposes algorithmic analysis as a method for developing a trans of color poetics. Poetic Operations won the Gloria Anzal Dual Book Prize in 2022 from the National Women's Studies Association. She is co-editor of the book series Queer Trans Digital at NYU Press with Amanda Phillips and Bo Ruberg. Cardenas co-authored book The Trans Real Political Aesthetics of Crossing Realities was published by Atropos Press. She is currently working on her next academic monograph tentatively titled After Man, Fires, Oceans, and Androids, as well as a multidisciplinary artwork about climate change's effects on the oceans and a science fiction novel about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. She is a first generation Colombian American. And please um, join me now again in welcoming our wonderful guests uh, to the staging area. <laughs> Hi there. Let's see. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Just finding the right, the right spot. OK. Does the mic seem to be picking up there OK? OK, great. Um, Hi, thank you so much to everyone um, who's here. Thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, I really, really appreciate the chance to share this work with you today. Um, so I am Bo Ruberg. I use they, them pronouns. I'm an associate professor at UC Irvine in Southern California. And today I'm going to be talking to you about envisioning new queer worlds through video games. Uh, just a little bit about me so that you kind of know where I'm coming from. I have a very mixed background. My PhD is in Complet but I worked in a department of video game design. I was in a school of computer science for a while. Um, now I'm back in the humanities, so hopefully you'll hear little bits of all of that here. Um, I had a book that just came out that I'm not talking about today, uh, which is this one, Sex Dolls at Sea, Imagine Histories of Sexual Technologies. It just won an award from SCMS, the Society for Cinema and Media Studies for Innovative Scholarship. And um, so if you're into sex dolls and sex tech, I recommend it. Um, but this is what I'm going to talk to you about today, this intersection of queerness and video games, which is where the majority of my work lies. Um, so video games are often dismissed or overlooked as being low culture or for kids, but they are actually a really rich site of queer meaning um, in contemporary media. So these are some of the projects that I've worked on. They each kind of represent a different approach to thinking about queerness in games. Um, video games have always been queer is about using queer theory as a new lens for interpreting and reclaiming the medium of video games. Queer Game Studies, which I co-edited with Adrian Shaw, is a community project where uh, scholars and designers came together to think about where queerness is located in, in games. And then the Queer Games Avant-Garde is a collection of interviews and profiles with active queer and trans artists and game makers who are part of a kind of amazing contemporary movement of queer independent game making. Um, so often when I talk about queerness and games together, people are surprised at this intersection because they think of video games as being um, homophobic or discriminatory and not having a lot of space for queerness. Uh, and in some ways that's true, but there is a lot that we can talk about here. So often you'll hear people talk about uh, queer representation in what's called AAA games, which are big mainstream games like the Last of Us Part II, which came out recently. Um, but there are also queer communities around games. 
There is queer fandom around games, lots of ways that people are bringing their queer experience to the medium. The thing I want to focus on is something a little bit different. So um, I want to think in a new way about how queerness is manifesting in and through video games. And I want to think in a new way about what we can take with us as queer people and queer scholars from the experience of play. Um, so this work comes from a new book project that kind of ballooned and became two new book projects. Um, one of them is about video games and queer world building. And one of them is about video games and queer post apocalypses. And if we think about those two things together, what we're going to get is this kind of larger topic of how video games create spaces for envisioning new queer worlds, whether those are alternative worlds of the present or worlds of the future. And I just want us to remember this idea that video games are an interactive medium. They let us not only view, but in fact inhabit worlds and are uniquely suited to helping us see how the world we live in could be otherwise. Um, so I'm gonna say upfront that the work that I'm doing here is very indebted to the work of others, including Tanisha, and um, so many other scholars and artists who have already explored related themes of queer world building, queer world making, and the radical potential of the post-apocalypse. So some of these include Marquise Bay, Alexis Colleen Gums, Misha Cardenas, Avery Alder, Jose Esteban Munoz, Sarah Ahmed, sorry for going fast, Susan Stryker, and many more. So let me be direct. Every video game is a world. Creating video games is fundamentally the work of building worlds. This is true for all video games, not just games set against the backdrop of elaborate narratives or complicated fictional locales, which are the elements of media that we normally associate with world building. Small games are worlds, strange games are worlds. It's common to talk about and therefore to imagine video games and their players through the language of worlds. We describe massively multiplayer online games as virtual worlds. We differentiate clusters of levels within a game by grouping them into different worlds. We're also seeing a growing interest in world building as a part of the craft of developing video games. Presentations at places like the annual Game Developers Conference promise tips and tricks for building more realistic or immersive worlds. Game creators are increasingly writing and talking about how they build the stories, characters, and lore that form the basis for their game worlds. But actually, I think it's incorrect, or maybe just insufficient, to understand world building in video games as a matter of narrative. Video game worlds are far more than the stories they tell. The shape and contours of video game worlds take form, first and foremost, through the design of their interactive mechanics, the rules and the possibilities they offer for play. Video games build worlds through the layouts of their levels, through their conditions for success and loss, through their computational physics, the way they imagine gravity and the movement of bodies. Each of these things is different in each different game. With each game, a world is born anew. Playing video games is itself the performative act that animates these worlds. So this means that when we step into a video game world, we have the chance to test the limits of the new worlds that we can envision. And we can begin to see in concrete terms what it might look like to remake our world a world dominated by cis-heteronormativity, the oppression of queer and trans people, white supremacy, and discriminatory practices of many kinds. So if each video game represents its own alternative world, it's perhaps unsurprising that much of the queer world building that takes place in video games is queer. A great number of video game worlds have powerful queer implications, whether or not they feature overtly, overtly LGBT characters. These games show us that reimagining the world as a process of design or a mode of activism always goes hand in hand with reimagining possibilities of gender, sexuality, intimacy, and desire. The field of, game, of queer studies has long been invested in queer world making, the idea that everyday practices of queer people manifest worlds. But queer making has often remained elusive and intangible. Video games model queer world making in action. They show us what it might look like to actually build a new queer world and set it in motion. Video games are queer worlds and they are provocations to go out and queer the world. So let me show you what I mean by looking at one specific game. <coughs> so 
So there are lots and lots of examples we can look at. Each one builds a queer world in a slightly different way. This game is called If Found. Um, it's an independent game released in 2020 uh, by Dreamfield, which is a small team led by the Irish um, game designer, um, Laura McGee. So If Found is an interactive novel about Cassio. So Cassio, who you see here, is a young trans woman who has been off at university working on her master's degree in astrophysics. She's now returning to her small rural community where she grew up on a remote island off the coast of Western Ireland. Cassio's story is told through writing and drawing that we find in the pages of her diary. The game takes place over the course of one long, cold month of December. As the days go by, Cassio struggles with her mother, who refuses to accept her gender identity. In response, Cassio leaves home and briefly builds this kind of ragtag queer family who live together in an abandoned mansion, but then her queer family falls apart too. With nowhere left to live, she retreats into despair and narrowly escapes freezing. Luckily, at the 11th hour, Cassio's friends arrive to save her and her mother embraces her, calling her for the first time by her true name and setting everyone on a hopeful path towards reconciliation. As a story then, If Found is relatively straightforward in that it moves in a straight line through a sequence of chronological events. If we consider only this aspect of the game, we might understand it as a painful but heartwarming tale of acceptance, a tale about how hard it is to be oneself when one is still figuring out what that even means, and a tale about getting close to the edge of oblivion and then coming back from the brink. If Found has been praised for its particular approach to narrative world building, the game is set in this very unapologetically specific place and time, this remote Irish island in the 1990s. It includes many words from the Irish language and references to Irish culture that are likely unfamiliar to an international audience. To make those references more accessible and thereby to more kind of richly animate the world, the game includes footnotes that explain certain terms and places. And so that's what you're seeing here is what, what, you have when, what happens when you click on one of those footnotes and it, it gives you more information. These imbue the game with a sense of realistic worldliness or atmosphere a feeling that Cassio's experiences are grounded in the material details of the real world. Yet just beneath that surface, If Found is deeply invested in exploring how worlds can be fractured and unmade, in queering the real world, in order to make a world that feels real to queers. Black holes are a recurring trope in the game. Cassio, as an aspiring astrophysicist, is fascinated by the destructive workings of the cosmic universe. When she is in these moments of emotional overwhelm, she scribbles black holes endlessly across her diary. Her narrative is also regularly intercut with unrelated scenes about an astronaut who travels through a black hole to save the universe. The astronaut eventually succeeds, but in doing so, she must face the total collapse of time and meaning inside the abyss of the black hole. For both Cassio and the astronaut, black holes represent a queer place where the laws of space and time, those guiding principles that uphold our universe, break down. The black hole is a place where time compresses and contorts itself until it barely exists at all, an aberration that reveals, as Karen Barad writes, that there has been something queer in nature all along. The black hole also becomes a figure of trans temporality, Hill Melatino has written against the linear teleological narratives in which trans individuals are expected to move cleanly through transition into joyful self-actualization. Instead, says Melatino, the experiences of transition, dysphoria, and gender euphoria often overlap, creating a palimpsest in which trans feeling, like time inside a black hole, happens impossibly all at once. The world of it found is a world that hinges on temporal contradictions, a world where time and the way we live our life inside it is far queerer than it seems. But what I want to stress here is that If Found conducts this temporal world building, not just through its narrative, but through its design, the way that it lets players play. So long before we hear any of Cassio's story or we see these black holes, we get this most basic fact of the game world, which is that the only thing you can do is a race. So I mentioned that If Found tells the story through pages of Cassio's diaries, but instead of flipping through those pages, what you're doing as a player is controlling an eraser. So your play is comprised entirely of erasing images and text from the screen, 
so that you can see other memories underneath them. In this way, Cassio's story moves forward, but the gameplay moves backwards. Or we might say the erasing mechanic moves downwards, through layer after layer of writing and drawing, taking us deeper into a page that has been written over and over. Here, erasure too becomes a metaphor for trans experience, one that unfolds through play. To reveal Cassio's story, players must also erase it. To find herself, Cassio must erase herself. This is a vision of trans identity that stands in marked contrast to more commonplace narratives that posit trans erasure and trans visibility in opposition. Here, in order to allow Cassio to be seen, players must participate in a world where visibility itself entails erasure. It's only in the very final moments of this game that the players get the ability to create instead of erasing. In the game's coda, we hear about Cassio's life as she settles in with her family and her friends. Now, when we move our pointer, words come out of the pointer. It's typical for video games to open with what's called a character creator, a set of options for how you want your character to look. If found ends with a character creator. The very last thing you do is choose what you want Cassio to look like. This marks both a transformation and a queer rewriting of time. The character, that a char the character that a player designs for Cassio represents what she looks like now, later in her transition, but it also represents somehow what she has looked like all along. And it's this that's the real radical queer world building that happens in a game like If Found. It's not the creation of a narrative or a setting, though those are also important, but the creation of a set of conditions for how a world itself might operate, a world in which both time and identity are fundamentally queer moving simultaneously forward, backward, down, and through. We play this queer world into being. So I've said that queer worlds, or the video games operate as provocations to create queer worlds. And we need those provocations now more than ever. As global climate crisis threatens to continue the viability of life on our planet, and as countries across the globe see a sharp rise in right-wing extremism. For marginalized people, these things raise very legitimate questions, right? How can we go about living in this world when it is increasingly full of danger? How can we inhabit a world that continues to be more inhospitable to the basic act of our living? It's no coincidence that many contemporary indie games made by queer and trans creators are apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic. Like if found, they are concerned with the vision, visions of the world's end and what kinds of queer togetherness are possible on the brink or in the wake of the world's destruction. Some of these games are interested in saving, or at least attempting to save, the imperfect world we inhabit. Others embrace the idea that to build a, queer, to build a world where queer people can live, we may need to destroy the world that has come before. The apocalypse is a real and pressing terror, but it is also a revelation, an acute moment of possibility. The post-apocalypse is a place of fear and loss, but also a place where new queer worlds <laughs> might flourish. For people of all identities standing now in these latter days of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world we thought we knew has come to look strange, fragile, and often deeply unfair. Writing in What World Is This, Judith Butler states, the pandemic makes us reconsider the world as an object of scrutiny, register the world as an object for alarm, mark the fact that this present version of the world was not anticipated. In this way, the pandemic has laid bare a revelation of the world as a different world than we thought it was. Video games are themselves objects of scrutiny. They can help us reflect on how our world is made and how it might be made differently. They challenge us to imagine the seemingly impossible, inviting us to step into worlds where the fundamental truths we assume uphold the universe have been reshaped or discarded. Colleen Macklin, a game designer, has written, games are more about world building than about linear storytelling. If it's worlds that we are exploring with games, then isn't it possible for these algorithmic worlds to evolve, to allow for more flexibility and diversity in player desire? I would propose that games are queer because they provide us with a notably different way of looking at and living in the world. The queer utopia may already be here, in our games. Indeed, the queer worlds we find in video games offer us a toolkit for queering the world around us. However, these queer worlds are not tidy, unambivalent, or even easily instrumentalized. Like all queer works of art and ways of living, they are messy. Queer video game worlds are often silly and absurd, ecstatic and joyful, broken and mournful, counter-hegemonic in some ways and complicit with structures of power in others. 
Game worlds are universes in miniature that challenge us to question how the universe functions. Yet these games are themselves cautionary tales and imperfect guides, raising specters of ongoing toxicity or falling short of their radical potential. This imperfection too has its value. It reminds us that the work of making and remaking the world is always ongoing, and that making the world more queer is not necessarily one and the same with making it better. The queer utopia may already be here in our games, suggests Macklin. Yet in truth, queer worlds and video games are rarely utopias, nor are they dystopias. Instead, they are mirrors, reflecting back to us the shortcomings and the possibilities contained within our own reality, showing us how queer our world already is and how queer it could become. Thanks. Is it too dark for you guys? Oh, it's so perfect. <laughs> it's okay. I like the I like my audience to be in the dark. <laughs> Hi. Um, I am very happy and pleased to be uh, among you uh, to find such a diverse uh, audience, diverse public. Um, I am not so used to it at the moment. I haven't been living in Europe, uh, so anyway, um, very happy to be here, uh, particularly answering to the topics of the vision of the trans and queer regions. Uh, I have been thinking about, have we, can I really define these particular visions? Am I allowed or am I in the process of making the visions? And I think back on my work of a few decades and thinking maybe I have been trying every season, every episode, uh, trying to be making of the queer and trans visions. So um, indeed, uh, I think we are all ourselves going through the making of the self of ourselves. <coughs> in plural terms, uh, self as self, so they and they. Um, we are going through each transition, uh, tra what is that? transition or transition. Mm. It depends on if you want to capital T-R-A-N-X. So every time we trans or transitioning, we are going from today to tomorrow. Tomorrow, maybe not as good or maybe better, but anyway, today is who we are. It's just a temporary reference to today. So we can grow out of today very quickly. Um, however, we all grow not only by myself, by ourselves, we also grow with a community. The community we are in together here is a very, the best manifestation. So collectively, I consider myself as part of the uh, antenna going wild. I'm the mycelium rooted in the deep uh, forest. Or I could also be the protruding sensors. I'm the, uh, well, the high fire and I have the like a Oh, there's so many different animals. <laughs> the octopus. I love octopus. The octopus. I make, um, these are all my work. I, I do work with octopus, I work with mushroom, and I work a lot with antennas. So I consider myself part of these transgenic uh, creatures here. Um, so, in coming back to my trans and queer visions, uh, I must say, I would have to speak it in terms of multi-episode uh, as a series. I have a, actually never watched series. I can't watch series because I never understand what series means, that you're supposed to watch series every day or every week. I watch series, it's like there are 36 episodes, I watch it overnight. <laughs> so I, I actually have to not to watch series because I won't sleep for two days. So, um, however, I think back about all these visions, I think maybe each one of my work is working towards certain visions, and so each one of my work could be the episode in a series, multi-season, the whole life, maybe, yeah. 
So, um, another thing, just as I say, I'm very happy to see such a diverse crowd. Is also, I think about my maybe my uh, my visions. Uh, the most important uh, elements in my visions may be the people. Uh, different characters I create for different work, the people, uh, the different creatures I create um, uh, from my different work, maybe it's the most uh, interesting in terms of the, um, uh, thinking about the visions. So these are just some uh, pictures from actually the film I just finished called Yuki, and so I'll come to it. Anyway, just a couple of pictures of the, the avatars that I created. I created 20 avatars for this movie. Uh, and uh, so they all live in this uh, trash field in the deep continent. But I want to flash back to earlier work uh, called Random. So this is work, 1998-1999. Um, it's set up as a one-year um, narrative project in installments, and so it's the yeah, it lasts for one year, 98 to 1999. It is actually presented more like an episodic form because every time I can, throughout the year, I can keep uploading different interface, inviting different artists to join and creating different uh, branch out of the main theme. Um, for example, there are different interfaces in this work. Uh, for example, there's a big doll, there's a, a road trip, uh, the theater anatomicon, there's also uh, the Panopticon, a moon play. Uh, at that time, I truly believe uh, interface as intervention. The other thing I think, I always think about why did I come see, this was very early in the 90s, and uh, the web is just the beginning. You know, we're still dealing with, uh, basically we're still dealing with like 56K modem, you know, not like, you had a speed, and so there was a lot of question about who can see this work, who had no bandwidth to see this work. So I said, wow, you should go to the museum, the museum, the public space, the public Wi-Fi should offer uh, people to see this work. However, I set it up as one year. I think about why I did that uh, as the first uh, web art commission by the Guggenheim. It's, uh, I think about this because I was really worried about censorship. And I thought that if I put it on the web, I can say this is just a work in processing, in always in process, so you cannot really preview the work, so there's no way to censor it. So that works. Yeah. Um, this particular just kind of fresh a bit. So this particular work also actually, Brandon is taken off the, from the name, uh, Brandon Tina. Uh, the trans being in Nebraska who was uh, raped and murdered in 1992 uh, on the New Year's Eve because he's true gender or having female uh, atomic was discovered and uh, so was raped and murdered along with two of his friends. Uh, so I took up the story of Brandon Tina and considered if I could ever upload such a trans being as Brandon who in his life was never able to get out of the state line from Nebraska. I think, you know, you know, in the early days, like all the trans queer, they all go to the coast. They go to California and they go to New York. Uh, so Brandon was never able to get out of Nebraska. So this particular piece, I uploaded Brandon out to the cyberspace and thinking maybe cyberspace, we can imagine a different world. Maybe there is, uh, at the time, there was a whole advertisement about there's no race, no gender in the cyberspace, which proved not to be true. <laughs> However, we can debate this forever. So anyway, so um, I did a lot of trial sessions uh, in this work also. This was the, toward the end of this one year performance that uh, I would do this kind of online virtual session to take any case of the trans people that was murdered or jailed. Uh, into, uh, uh, I took the case out and asked people to read the case and then we, we have this kind of tri trial sessions and I used the, the trans uh, test for, you know, if you want to take home and you have to pass this test. So I used that test, it's very long, it's like 100 questions as the way to, uh, to, for the audience, for the people to register if you want to be a juror. So that, that was the interface. Anyway, go on to, um, it's gonna flash in the episode, right? 
Um, <laughs> IKU is a film made in 2000. Uh, by this time, I just came out from Brandon and I went to, Cal uh, went to Japan, Tokyo, uh, went into pretty much the underground of the, the porno production. I really want to make a film called, uh, it's actually it's what I consider a, a Japanese sci-fi sci -fi porn film, but at the end, it will kind of become claimed as a cyberpunk uh, film. So. I become a cult director as well. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, I think you also tells the story. Uh, it's sort of take off on Blade Runner. So imagine that like, in Blade Runner we never really see sex between Decca and Rachel, and uh, I can you actually employ a. Uh, uh, a runner, which is the IKU actually means orgasm in Japanese, so IKU sounds more like IBM, so it's more scientific. So it's a long story, but anyway, basically talking about this big company sending out IKU the EQ coder, like the orgasm coder and to have sex with human being to take the orgasm data and using this orgasm uh, to make into the chips and you can pop the chip, you can buy the chips uh, onto your mobile phone, you can have uh, orgasm on the go. Yeah. <laughs> this was the uh, year 2000. <laughs> it's a futuristic film. <laughs> um, but, okay, so continue with Brendan. I must say my 90s and until IKU, I was totally obsessed with processes. So every of my work contained a lot of penis. So um, kind of uh, 3D penis, you know, it's like dildo, a lot of dildo, yeah, a lot of dildo. <laughs> Which actually got replayed in my current film, an uh, updated version, 2003 version of oh, another deal done. <laughs> yeah. Quickly, uh, the next film after IKU, it took me, uh, at the time I finished IKU, I already have an idea for the next movie, and it will be about fluid, uh, fluid as of ejaculation. This is a, I'm sorry, this is an audience, you, you study diverse uh, sexuality, right? Like, I can use orgasm or fruit or ejaculation the way I like it. <laughs> and like, as many times I like to speak it. Uh, so fruit is all about ejaculation, the female and male ejaculation, and how the ejaculation, the white fruit, becomes the 21st century, that replace the white powder, the cocaine and become the 21st century drugs. So it also involved a kind of corporate story, how this bad, you know, how the, uh, but basically it's about uh, how the HIV virus got uh, mutated. Uh, I lived through the 80s in New York City, so I have always wanted to make a movie about the HIV and AIDS, particularly through the 80s during the biggest, the, the most difficult time in downtown uh, New York, uh, across the world. Um, so Fuiz area is in a way kind of sort of my self salvation to reconcile with uh, lost intimacy, with lost friends. So uh, Fui Zero actually uh, is sex, drugs, and rock and roll in a way. So the, when you have these people whose ejaculation uh, the fluid uh, become like drugs that you can take it and you can get it high. So imagine you have these people amongst you, uh, what I call the zero jam people, and these people become the most desirable by three different people, different uh, agency. One is the government. The government would think we want to eliminate these people because they, they prove that the whole HIV, the AIDS crisis is still not over, and so we have to arrest these people and eliminate them. Um, you also have the drug lord who would want to profit through the ejaculation and make uh, drugs, um, you know, have a drug trade going on. Also, they are, they are chased after the pharmaceutical company because if uh, this fluid can get you high, it must be also can include your cosmetic uh, use. Yeah. So anyway, um, it is a story about all these three elements come together. So again, this is probably, fluid probably 
shows my 21st century obsession with fluid. Yeah. So I have a lot of ejaculation in the film. Every, every. And these are the, the, the zero gen used in the factory to produce ejaculation. So any way possible. Anyway. Um, but it took me from IKU to Fui Zero, it took me 17 years to make this film. So Fui Zero was first conceived in 2000. I didn't get to finish the release of the film until 2017. And after that, I thought that I should become a more like a normal artist. So, <laughs> so, okay. so I presented, I, I, yeah, it's kind of accidentally I got chosen to represent Taiwan um, uh, to do an installation, a kind of solo installation, occupy these uh, uh, palette, uh, palette, uh, the Pujoni prison used to be a prison. And so I come up with the title three by three by six. It actually stands for three by three by six equal nine meter and six surveillance camera. So these are the standard kind of prison high security, highly surveillance uh, security, highly surveillance high security uh, prison cell usually reserved uh, for a political prisoner or terrorist. However, it also uh, at one point used to uh, jail some uh, sexual offenders. So. For me, it was uh, uh, yeah, it was striking. But anyway, three by three by six actually deal with ten cases. At the end, I want to use the the site of the exhibition site being used to be the prison in seventeenth century, and Casanova used to be in prison here. So I use the site to construct uh, ten cases of uh, inmates that who are in prison because of sexual or gender, um, how would you say that? You cannot, a kind of deviance, right? But I was told that we cannot use sexual deviance anymore. So, um, so there are 10 cases in this film, and each film is represented in 10 minutes, and it's sort of quite magical, sort of, you know, it's not really documentary. I'm just gonna go through this, so you have Casanova, you have a uh, sad. Uh, I also want to know that for these 10 cases, 10 film, I was playing with sort of cross gender or changing gender. So sad was actually played by a woman. We also have for co X, for co or I add an X, sorry. I also use X. <laughs> uh, at the time, I thought any of these cases, only of these case because of their crime as they are being prison uh, is not a single case. There are many more Foucault's, there are many more Sa, there are many more Casanova. So I use an X in every character I use. So Foucault's uh, case is like, it's actually kind of unknown, but he was actually imprisoned in Poland around 1954. Uh, they, they actually trick him. It's a really good story. They trick him to confess that he's gay and you know put into the prison. Uh, and so, um, then there's the BS, the the woman who's supposed to cut off her husband's uh, penis and put it in the washing machine. Uh, not washing machine, but juice machine. No garbage disposal. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what you do deal with a lot of machine, but it's a garbage disposal. <laughs> anyway, okay. How about we make a pen, a penis cake? <laughs> anyway, so there is also MWX. Who, I'm talking about these. These are really queer, diverse character, right? But um, um, I'm sorry I laughed because uh, it, 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 it was such a tremendous to make, to, to put these 10 cases together and to think about each one of their journey is not single. It's because there are many more of these cases around. And then if you think some of the cases you think about why are they imprisoned, it, it makes you so anger, uh, angry. So you, you actually have to find another way of relief. Uh, for example, this case is about the uh, M.W. is a German guy. I, I don't use the real name except for the historical character, but M.W. Uh, is a German guy who uh, through online meeting someone and this someone agreed to be 
um, to be cut and uh, eaten. And so it was kind of, they have a legal contract and then he, he ended up to be in prison at the end. And so I, I did have all these. Um, so. This is another case of 00X. Uh, he's a, a Taiwanese, uh, HIV positive, uh, doing camp sex and also in prison for 13 years. Yeah, so uh, this is DX. It, uh, I think I'm using these as many cases about deception, about how there was a lot of cases of how trans, um, trans men, um, trans men uh, by using a dildo or the object uh, is cheating uh, in these uh, sexual uh, encounters. So that was also many, many of these cases, yeah. Uh, there's also RX, uh, having conversation with Foucault. This is a case of uh, particularly uh, a case of the Muslim uh, being accused of uh, sexual behavior but was put into a 3x3x6 three by three by uh, prison cell. So uh, a Chinese woman was accused because uh, she put the sexual content onto the web. On the web. Then there's a case of S <laughs> FSB. FSB stands for, uh, and they are actually harvest, uh, they harvest food, so they are also queen. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, speaking about the, the 3 by 3 by 6 is actually curated by Colby Preciado uh, for this show, and I just want to quote uh, something he wrote, a dissident collective history of sexuality, where transform science fiction queer and anti-colonial imagination provide visual and critical frameworks to think through the history of subjection and resistance and to actively involve in the critical qualification of poetic and political actions for digital times. Um, so I do work with Paul very closely and uh, uh, it was a really a process of uh, collaboration between artist and curator. Um, quickly jump to my current film, Yuki, am I still on time? Um, again, <laughs> it seems it takes me a long time to uh, to make films. So Yuki was conceived in 2009. At that time I conceived Yuki as an IKU sequel. I was thinking about how would you do with a replicant like in IKU, the replicant who was sent out to collect orgasm data. What would you do when the data was collect the data collected and their hard drive is full, the kind of cyborg body the hard drive is full. So they are basically a piece of e-trash and you just want to dump them on the e-trash bill. And the story for Yuki actually starts with this uh, uh, premise. But however, uh, by the time I could really uh, get the, some money and make it into a feature it was 2020. So I start writing a long feature script uh, uh, of this film, and uh, I took in a lot of, uh, uh, basically because Yuki is already the name of the virus, and you know, um, so I took in a lot of uh, 2020 to 2022, uh, much of the COVID uh, uh, situation uh, into the film also. That's a different setup. This is the, like in the city, there's three stories, uh, three story lines happening at the same time in the city, in the diner. Uh, there's also the Gannon Corporation. I love corporation. I, I love to fuck with them. Uh, so uh, you have uh, this red pill made by uh, Gannon Corporation. So uh, this is your pressure of business or your data of profit. Uh, this is, uh, a, a, for me, it's like a, a struggle always about how the corporation, the pharmaceutical, uh, could have so much control for our body. So, um, oh, sorry. Um, I, the main, the main, there's a different thread, different narrative in the film. But uh, maybe the main thread follows actually follow uh, Reiko from uh, from IKU, the replicant uh, IKU coder when he was when she was dumped as a PC trash and being in the e trash bill set in the continent, presumably Africa, uh, where a lot of electronic trash is done. So uh, imagine these uh, 
this rec kind of out of function, the function uh, obsolete uh, replicant trying to reboot own body, and through this reboot, also meeting all these different creatures, transgenic uh, creatures on the continent, and through the process, what happened. And so I'm going to show a little clip. This is not really in uh, as in the film, but it's sort of introduction of what I call Yuki virus becoming. Reiko is a replicant eco-coder. Gingham Company owns Reiko. Reiko is dispatched to the human world to collect orgasm data. Full hard drive of orgasm data downloaded. Reiko is deemed redundant. Reiko is dumped as a piece of e-trash by Gingham Company. Reiko lies horizontally amidst the AC charger, fans, motherboards, CPDs. Reiko attempts to get up, but the body is glitched. She can barely keep the body aligned in shape. Water drops are sprayed abruptly onto Reiko's face. Reiko's face appears as water flow. Reiko's clear water face reflects Barry's pockmarked face in black and white. Reiko's body is taking new shape, blobs pumping gently like bread dough rising. Alba stretches their tentacles and wraps Reiko's ever-forming dough body. Skitch approaches Reiko to add a few charcoal strokes for a body suit. Amidst the stacked PCB boards, something is moving from underneath. A copper-colored Reiko appears, revealing a body embedded with circuited patterns. A Xenosilver 2020 processor.122, 5 GHz, 128-bit, year 2020. Violet throws to Reiko a robot arm. Reiko attaches the robot arm to her right arm, picking up e-trash. Reiko's circuited body shifts alignment. Zeno's testicle-like device beams laser light. Over Reiko's shifting circuited body, Zeno injects her DNA codes on Reiko. Reiko rewrites own codes. Code scrambled on Reiko's brown-colored iris. Ozone bends down, sucking codes out of Reiko's iris. Reiko makes a sudden sneeze, discharging micro droplets into the air. The virus is born. Okay. So uh, uh, it is actually a full-length uh, film, uh, what I call a viral, uh, a sci-fi viral old reality cinema. By the way, I do have to uh, sort of invent my own genre in my own filmmaking because at, at the end I don't exactly know how to call it. Is it drama, fiction, documentary, or experiment? I hate the word experimental. <laughs> <laughs> but yesterday we did have an experimental class. <laughs> so, um, so at the moment, uh, I'm hoping to release the movie. I'm in the process of uh, release this movie, Yuki, uh, this year. Hopefully, it will come to Toronto in the fall. Um, this is such good advertisement already. <laughs> anyway, so I'm just going to end up uh, end with uh, this little note. What will be the next season, the next episode? Isn't that like commercial? Um, exactly. So uh, I am actually working on a theater piece, Haga Dreaming. And I'm, been, I'm working with some indigenous people in Taiwan, performers, not binary. And so for me, to going back to uh, 
the kind of living with cosmos, uh, what they call the Gaia principle of living, combined with techno shaman techno shamanism, uh, would be a vision of the non-binary indigenous techno future, and that will be the next season I'm working on. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you to um, Dana, Elliot, and Christopher, who's not here, um, for um, this, this, this and this and share of some, some of my own work and ideas. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm going to give you a very quick and dirty overview of my practice over the last kind of 30 years and the basis of the ideas. I've been like, thinking through and um, working with. So I'm, I'm, I want to kind of start with uh, provocation. And provocation is this. I'm, in terms of queer theory and queer practice, for me, I do not believe that queer theory does sex very well. And so I'm, I think queer theory is great at disrupting ideas around sexuality, but I do not think it deals with sex and pleasure and erotic and body and flesh and skin, all those things that makes us queer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, I think the more that queer theory has uh, mainstreamed itself, it's will become more sanitized mm -hmm. and more palatable. And then because I think that I'm, <coughs> because I'm queer theory, including black queer theory and then other kind of theory is very like forward thinking. It it didn't actually focus on what is done to queer bodies and it should. And also we need to have a conversation around what is it that we want done and through our own queer bodies as well. And I, I think that when it comes to sex and the erotic somehow queers will do amazing great work in terms of their thinking forget about their own material bodies of an actor. My work comes out of that space of an actor that, you know, our pleasure, our erotic and joy needs to be centered in any form of social justice work. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think I'm any form of social justice work that includes a material body is quite a frigid kind of polity. And I'm, that's what I kind of push against in my work. And then also, if I speed up a bit, somebody look at me to slow down, mm -hmm. it's because I didn't fall into my northern <coughs> accent, and then you won't understand a word I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, a lot of my work includes portraits, self-portraits, and as why well, most of the work is I'm constructed inside the art studio, and I'm part of thinking is how do we move away from a binary framework? male, female, black, white, straight, gay, self of the ninth day. I think most of our thinking is locked into this binary framework. And the challenge is how you move out of the binary framework and then not fall back into it somehow. So then actually a lot of my work plays around with um, a range of um, signifiers around the body. As actual props play a key, a key role, wigs and masks and so on and so forth. And of course, then something that happens and when you are then bring queer into the conversation and across that with blackness mm -hmm. and race as well. And so actually, I think that queer needs to do better around mm -hmm. some of these messy areas that we kind of in inhabit as our queer folks. Mm -hmm. And this is just some, some of my <coughs> early narrative <coughs> <Nike> work. <laughs> And I'm um, and um, as a um, darkroom artist, um, lots of the ideas around a uh, black queer photographic practice seems always is locked into the content of the work. And what is then missing is the process of making this thing called the photograph. And then actually, I would argue that most work by a black and queer artist is read through its content, it's read through its sociology and then process 
at the making get sidestepped. And for me, then I think that we also have to have another conversation around pleasure and the making of the thing called the photograph. What else is going on when we construct images around black and queer experiences? I'm saying process gets sidestepped. As an actually, if we are, we are then talk, talk then about identity and then we then sidestep other the parts of the artist, it's then doing that very, um, it's not doing this disservice to the queer artists when we only look through that particular kind of sub and actually a lot of that work and also, um, and then I'm, I'm sorry, um, this is from the Black Circus Massive, I'm so, so um, a lot of my work, if you then um, look at the work very carefully, sometimes a lot of the models have their eyes closed, so in Africa we talk about world making, and but world making is always outside somewhere. What then about the world making internally? Imagination, fiction, desire, fantasies, appetites, there's other kind of queer worlds that is hard to access but it's sense or it's felt. So I'm, I then draw upon my own experiences as I'm someone who isn't out about being a Ryan SNM and kink master. And because I'm, once again, there is lots of spaces that we don't hear the voices of. Then your folks of black and queer and kinksters and sex workers and drug takers. There are these other kind of narratives that we actually exclude even within our own queer spaces and, and um, even our own black queer spaces, we kind of push certain kind of narratives to one side because I think that with <coughs> queer politics, a lot of politics actually is almost a respectability politics. So then once again, I think I miss the idea when queer was more messy and more dirty. I miss those perverts, those queers who were pushing against other kinds of queers. So then actually, I think that our Queer work has got to be challenging to other queer folks as well. As you know, usually queer is a lot into this time framework, and that's an interesting thought. Absolutely not. My thing is, what else is going on around our queer experiences? But how do we then account for those other kind of worlds that we inhabit as well? So naturally, how do we inhabit or feel? This thing called queerness, not how we think about queerness, but how we feel about this thing called queerness. Um, and of course, I, 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 I also have an, I, I am also acknowledge that the photograph also has its limits, it's because it can also kind of capture some of these things that the artists might feel as well. And but I, I think that we still need to have other kinds of conversations that also brings in. I think on pleasure, intimacy, touch, mm -hmm. tactility, texture, and, and these things for me needs to be accounted for and spoken for as well. Mm -hmm. And a part of the work is still always around what are the images that I need to see as a black queer man. So when my work is still creating um, Images that I I am need to see and I still don't see a lot of work by black queer practitioners around intimacy. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, my work is around creating that. So I'm um, this is like heels I'm um, 2020. So I'm I'm you saw the picture of our heels from 93. I'm so I'm and there are certain kind of um, objects that I come come back to again and again, and I heal the fishnets, the things that turns me on. So then these things kind of always come back again and again and again. And this image is called Solar Anus. I'm from um, 2020. So I'm, I love the images around the black male body as I've always been centered around the big black dick message. <laughs> that. And there's something about the anus that we do not see right here. And because the anus almost looks into the body, 
in this interesting kind of way. You know, academics could then also look like a vagina as well. Part of my work is then to then photograph and other parts of the body as well. In the best I'm, I'm, I actually want to talk about being an archivist, but I'm, I also sort of think in terms of kind of then to so talk, so talk about the archive quickly, if the archive is a place that holds memories, then I, you have to put argue then that the black queer body is also an archive, is because then our dicks and, and dicks and holes, nipples and breasts also hold memories. And that means that we have the need to also then rethink this very thing that we call the archive as well. So that the body and the material body is an archive and then also it's something that talk about the actual materiality of our lived experiences. So then, I'm, I'm sorry, yes, the cultural is fine, the political is fine, I thought there's something about the materiality of our lived experiences and that I might keep coming back to. I'm gonna go back to this thing. So I'm, I want you to close your eyes for a second, everybody, it does in for one second and and I and my last project is called the ecstatic sacred and the images I was calling images here I want you to think about the last time that you all had great sex right <laughs> right right how did you feel in that moment of orgasm ejaculation yeah what do you feel in that particular moment that you went Ugh! or whatever noise you can make right here, yeah? right? I'm so I can open your eyes now. I'm so basically, am I? I'm a, a piece of work called I'm the Aesthetic Sacred was trying to capture this space that I would argue is a space of non-identity, right? Yeah, right. I think in the moment of Orgasm, what is then lost is the social formations around the body and identity. And, the, and at this moment, something else is happening now. And for some people, it might be spiritual, for some people, it might be transcendental. And I am calling this an elsewhere space whereby we put on hold all of these identities that are important, but we're kind of obsessed with. So then, what happens if we then lose these for that moment? <laughs> and the best, and then I think that the challenge of the trying to articulate that moment is that it operates beyond language. It's not linguistic. It, yes, yes, and there is the sonic that, that, that's attached to that moment, but I think that there's something else happening when we put these things on hold. And then all that social, cultural stuff, gets pushed to one side for a nanosecond. So then that's why I want you to think about what happens in that moment. And so I'm, and so this is a series is a portrait of men, women, I'm a few trans folks, a few straight folks, and who are photographed on the verge or during or just after that moment of all that. <laughs> And so I'm, 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 these are some of the um, works I've been creating over the last few years as well. And I'm, one thing that is I'm missing when we talk about queer bodies is a conversation around gestures and our movements, a tacit knowledge, those things that we just know in the body. And, and so once again, um, and we have to talk about these other ways that we are in the world as well, including our internal world and the world that we create with each other, even if it's in that moment of a sexual encounter. Right? All of these moments that we need to talk about and we'll still be aware of what's happening in terms of the materiality of one's body. And I think I'm, I'm, it's because I'm, and we so locked into representation 
and visibility, I think that we forget the other senses like touch, smell, and taste, or the ways that we also are in the world of our queer beings. And I think kind of where we need to expand the conversation that includes the senses, that includes sensation, and that means that vision is then not at the top of the hierarchical tree. When, um, and so when we talk about I and I, black bodies or queer bodies or other kinds of bodies as well. And so I'm, I'm, yes, yeah, so basically it's like how we talk about emotional feelings, right? And, and then, but also not, not at all coming from the space of pain and trauma. So that's not to exclude people's lived experiences. And I think that there is a reluctance to talk about the erotic and pleasure in all kinds of ways. And then yes, it, and yes, it depends on the context that we're, we're having these conversations, but I think that there is a reluctance to have particular kinds of conversations about who we are and what, and what we are. And so my work is then trying to constantly try to push of dialogue and conversation. And this is from 2020, and this is called Object of Desire. Um, and this is called Beard. Hmm. And I'm talking about people's beards. <laughs> And then, of course, I, 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 it's I'm interesting just always photographing these things of people that you're, you're turned on by. And then somehow, I, I, we don't have a conversation around, you know, what is it that also turns me on? And they're not feeling ashamed to talk about that in an open way. So when actually, and then sometimes the danger with queer politics is that we always want to attach pleasure and erotic to this thing called queer. To to one to one, the social and the public, and what happens if we just have sex for sex sake, and that's it? Mm -hmm. I do not always want to attach it to something else to I don't know, and to make it more acceptable or to give it some kind of meaning or or some kind of a deeper understanding. Sometimes I think for me, it's okay just to have sex for sex sake, and then not call it queer sex or black sex, and and you know actually. And there's no such thing as queer sex anyway, there's just sex. It's because the minute that you call it queer sex, and you're marking it as different, the same thing with marriage. If you call it queer marriage, you're marking it as different. Queer doesn't always have to do that thing that's different. That's why I think queer is frigid. It, it's, it, it's just been taken up in this way that somehow it's too cold. And so basically, I kind of like, when it's more warm, it's more fleshy, it does that thing. It's like when somebody kisses you, <laughs> right? Yeah, you like that feeling of that intimacy. It does something. It's not a cold theory. It, because actually, I think that is the how does the theory works with and through the material body. That's where I come in and through the yeah, lens of queer. And this is Crow Bird Boy, twenty twenty three. Actually, I'm if this was done. It's the so on. Part of the work is that how do we step out of the social cultural and then enter the space of imagination, in fiction, and myth making. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm so on. A lot of the work is just conceptual, just trying to complicate a lot of these narratives that I, I find like, yeah, interesting, but what about this? What about that bit? And this is my. And so my final point um, is around I'm 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 given this moment that we're in around um, you know transphobia, right wing politics, around fascism across Europe, I'm I mean you know, murder, violence. I think that it's paramount in this moment with all these cultural and political intensities. I think that it's paramount that we do not lose sight of our material bodies, 
I think I think I think that it's important that we do, do not lose sight of pleasure and sex. I think it's important that we do not lose sight of intimacies with ourselves and with each other. Um, and so I am I am that's my final point and then my final teaser is then I'm next month I will show up in up in London a part of it will include new portraits of black trans men and I'm um, <coughs> as a portrait of Pat and Prince. So I as a photographer, as an artist, I work with 18th century printing processes and this work would be I'm um, Pat and Prince. And and the reason why I work with Pat and Prince is is that Peter A keeps me in the dark room, but then there's these other concepts around materiality and texture and touch and sensation and smells. And I so thought for me there was something about when I touched that chemical and that chemical also touched me. So that we and they need to then have a concept around process and making that accounts for how we engage with process and making through and with our uh, black and queer bodies. Um, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Hey. Hi. Hi, good to see you, everyone. Um, thanks so much to Dana and Elliot and Christopher and everyone who organized this. It's really Wonderful to be here with so many brilliant, amazing inspirations of my own. Thanks to the introverts. Please let me know if I uh, am going too fast. Um, I want to uh, show some, focus on new work and recent work and show you um, this five, five and a half minute film that is uh, showing, it, it, it actually premiered here at the TIFF Light Box in Cyrus Marcus Ware's program infinite points on a circle. Um, maybe you saw it, I don't know. Uh, but it's US premiering at Outfest Fusion this month. Um, it's called Oceanic Queer in the Ocean. And it's about, um, uh, it's about loss and grief and how we uh, move through uh, the loss, feelings of loss from losing people and places to COVID and climate change and uh, Losing capacities also and climate change. Um, and how do we build a new world, new queer, trans, abolitionist worlds out of this, this difficult moment? So I hope you enjoy it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I made this with my collaborators, Gerald Cassell, and Afriz, Cynthia Ling Lee, Susanna Ruiz, Huey Truong. Uh, and we made it on uh, this beach, Natural Bridges Beach, which uh, Gloria Anzaldúa wrote about. She wrote about in an essay um, that was quoted at the beginning, uh, Unnatural Bridges, Unsafe Spaces. Uh, and as far as I know, first time, that essay is the first time in uh, women of color feminist literature where they were making an effort to include trans women. Um, and she wrote about this beach and the bridges. Uh, she was a student and professor at um, UCSC. And she wrote about this bridge uh, collapsing over time and thinking about changes in, in feminism and movement. Um, and uh, that beach was one of the first groups I took my foster daughter to. Um, and she's no longer with me. She lives with her biological family now, so that was a loss. Um, of a kind, I, I still still get to see her all the time. Um, yeah, we do this was very interlude. Um, it's okay. I don't think I got it. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, so I'm happy to take questions at the end um, about any of these things. Um, I will go briefly through the uh, theory stuff. So um, yeah, my book, Poetic Operations, uh, that uh, Dana mentioned at the beginning. Um, this book uh, 
It came out in 2022, and in it, I'm, I was really responding to um, queer of color critique and asking where's the trans of color books. Uh, started writing this in 2013, and um, there were no trans of color studies books to speak of until Marcia Ochoa's book, Waiting for a Day, came out in 2014. Um, but also in graduate school, doing an MFA and a PhD, nobody ever once signed a book by a trans woman for me to read. Um, and I thought, maybe I can try to change that. Um, so I wrote this book, a theory book, an academic book. Um, I think the two big interventions are thinking about algorithmic analysis, so thinking about how we can identify algorithms in digital media, um, and also how algorithms can help us think about um, art and performance and race and gender differently. Um, and thinking about algorithms broadly, um, an algorithm is basically a list of ingredients and a series of steps. Um, it's been sort of, you know, claimed by uh, Facebook, <laughs> uh, or Silicon Valley, or all those fucking white men that are supposedly are the technological geniuses. When algorithms were invented in the 8th century uh, in Uzbekistan uh, by Muhammad ibn al khwarizmi so um, they're they're much older than Steve Jobs, uh, and uh, I argue in many ways they're ours um, that we use. Uh, series of steps, which we can think of as a recipe or a ritual, um, that we use rituals to survive every day, to survive academic spaces, uh, to survive public spaces. Um, and I try to you know, shift the focus from endless obsession with categories and checkboxes and flags <laughs> to uh, motion and gesture, and thinking about poetics as a series of gestures to focus on. I offer three gestures to cut the shift and the stitch, I think the shift is uh, particularly relevant for thinking about different <laughs> forms of queer and trans vision. Uh, a lot of the book I write about just Sophie Kambasama's work, I had the blessing, uh, the luck of meeting her in Bogota once. And in this artwork, this is a, a holographic ID card. She, uh, she forged a national ID card, it's like a passport in the um, to be lenticular, to be that, depending on which angle you look at it, you would see two different images and two different gender markers. Um, so holograms, in that case, from this travesti artist, offer a different way of thinking about visibility. Um, maybe we, uh, maybe we can control our visibility uh, because having more visibility since 2014, and uh, being on the cover of Time magazine, <coughs> trans women color. Um, has not benefited them, uh, has meant a lot more murder. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in the United States, uh, like we talked about in our the experimental class with all the brilliant and amazing students that came, thanks for coming. Um, of course, right now in the US, all those, a lot of those former gains of visibility are turning into really terrifying moments. With, uh, you probably know, uh, the governor there, Ron DeSantis, um, asked universities for a list of any students who have received transgender health care um, to do who knows what. So, visibility, not so great. Um, so I also talk about my own artwork in this. Seven minutes, okay. Uh, I talk about this work local autonomy networks that was about building local uh, safety networks for queer and trans people of color. Um, part of that work was done here with the Nike Sex Worker Action Network, a series of workshops. Um, I also talk about Redshift and Portal Metal. Um, the game when I moved here in 2015 uh, and said, uh, oh, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> uh, it's a game about a trans woman that moves to an ice planet. Because <laughs> uh, I grew up in Miami and then I did grad school in Southern California and then I came here and it was an ice storm and a polar vortex. And I was like, really don't know how to cope with this. I'm going to write some poems about how fucked up this. And uh, yeah, there, it's, uh, it's an interactive video slash performance slash poem. And there's, uh, I think, three different planets that you can get to in the game. Um, but in the conclusion of the book, I talk about visionary activism, which is a term I learned at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit. And um, I cite this particular protest that was here in Toronto with uh, statues 
like the King Edward VII statue at Queen's Park being covered in pink paint with uh, these stencil saying abolish on it and a press conference that followed where Raven Wings, you may know Raven Wings, brilliant, incredible, local, two-spirit, trans, black Mohawk artist who was my dance teacher for a long time uh, and was in Wretched and Blue Mill. Um, she said this in the press conference, you're lucky this is all we did. You're lucky we're appealing to your humanity. You're lucky we're not asking for vengeance or revenge because that would be easy. Our love is radical, it's abolitionist. It's a future where each and everybody has what they need, what they deserve, and what they want. So I think visionary activism is really important to me, thinking, oh, I'm going too fast. Okay. Oh, I'm going to switch everything. Okay. What? It's just hard to switch. Okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, This idea, you know, from Octavia's brood, that all organizing is science fiction, that we have to imagine the world we want to make it real, and the more clearly we can imagine that world that we are building, then the faster we can get there, perhaps. Um, so I think that abolitionist movement, prison abolition and police abolition, is a great example of a movement that's driven by a vision of a world where we don't put people in cages, and not just driven by grievances. I think that's a, been a really important concept for me. Um, God damn, I'm taking too long, because I wanted to read some of my new novel. I've been working on a new book called After Man, I'm skipping that. Here's <laughs> 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 my studio, here's the augmented reality artwork called Seen Soul. Um, here's the installation view of that. It's the video we saw. Let's do this. Um, all right. So this novel is coming out on October 10th from uh, AK Press in the um, Immersion Strategy series. So grateful to Adrian Murray Brown for that. Um, the pre-order link is on bookshop.org. If you want to pre-order, email it to me today. I asked them for that for this time. This book is dedicated to May and Isla and all my friends who carried me through and all our hopes for a livable future. All right, I know I'm just in a few minutes. Here goes. Cora. Cora sat on the toilet, looking down at the beige line pattern in the floor tile as it flickered and slowly tilted before reality snapped back into place. There was again that slow spinning feeling. She had thought it was gone, but here it was again. Along with her eye twitch and her nightmares, here was another thing that had worsened after the election. The moments when it happened, this feeling, seemed to also accompany a slowing of time. She would be sitting there and suddenly notice that her visual field was slipping, turning ever so slightly, and then came the sinking in her stomach and the thought, oh no, it's back. The doctor said it was benign positional vertigo. She knew it was more. Vertigo didn't explain the flicker. This is my first time reading this in public. <laughs> oh, Sitting up and sighing, she felt the familiar pain in her neck that had also returned after the election. She looked at the inside of the stall door, gray and free of dialogue, until she turned on her fog lenses. That's AG lenses. Uh, one of her favorite things about women's restrooms, which were different from men's rooms, is that they were usually full of graffiti. You are beautiful, just, and then crossed out, as you are, and then crossed out, just lose a few pounds, and then crossed out, no shit, and then, cro and then not crossed out, just learn to see it. More graffiti, report him at pussygramsback.ogspot.org. Fuck emos, date goths. Fuck gods, date girls, fuck everyone, and enjoy. <laughs> We're just a few of the philosophical debates and layers of scribbled words that could be seen with a slight head gesture, which enabled the optional content in their odd lenses or disabled it. The lenses use a simple algorithm to determine what gesture the user made on the changes in visual content instead of relying on accelerometers of earlier clunkier devices. She took a deep breath. Centering herself before going back out into the world, looking at the stall door, spacing out. She still missed Rana. She missed her black curls, her voice, her tenacity. She was still sitting on the toilet. She could hear other people coming in and out of the restroom. She heard the automated announcement from the mechanical female voice. Please report any suspicious persons to airport security. Any luggage left behind may be subject to inspection or destru destruction 
Thank you for your cooperation. Together, we can make Cascadia Airport safer. These words always gave her pause. For so many years, her appearance had been somewhere on the suspicious spectrum. Is the gender, is, oh, is gender transgression suspicious? Are the skin and hair of a Latina woman suspicious? Is a Latina woman covered in tattoos and fierce eyeliner suspicious? <laughs> Why don't people call airport security all day to report? I suspect the old white woman in the seat across from me in the waiting area is planning violent actions against me because I'm not white and my gender doesn't fit anywhere in her realm of understanding. Of course, she knew what qualifies as suspicious. That includes anyone black, Muslim, queer, trans, certainly anyone poor enough not to lack a telltale red indicator dot in their retina, evidence of an active AUG device. She finally stood up. Only a couple years ago she had surgery, and when she went under to have her gender confirmed, she also got her odd lenses. The past few years it has become common for people getting any surgical procedures to have their odd lenses implanted in their eyes when they were under. I'll last 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, okay, yeah, so questions. Yes. Hi there, thank you so much. My, my name is Mark, Mark Whitson from the University of Well. Hi. Um, uh, recent, I've heard a lot of you talk about queer theory, and more recently, um, I've heard a flurry of activity around queer methods. Uh, can, you can't hear me through my, my mask, I'm sorry. Um, uh, You've all talked about queer theory. More recently, I've heard uh, a flurry of activity around define queer methods and defining queer methods. And um, I wonder what a queer method <laughs> means to each of you. Um, I think I mm. oh, um, well, I think that a queer method has got to undo queer itself. Um, to be honest, I think that there's a danger if you try to define what queer is and then define what the method is. I think that it's got to be, it's got to do something else. Um, and so I method, yeah, yeah, I think that it's got to undo the very thing that it's trying to do. I do not even give it a name. That's what I can do. Think about queer methods as a, oh, I don't think we're this. Um, I think about queer methods in terms of rejection of categories and trying to uh, think outside of categories. And uh, I think that's a lot easier said than done. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. I, as I say, I, I feel. I think we all, you know, in terms of queer method, I think it's uh, more about creating your own genre, like, you know, whichever genre you're creating, then, um, because, you know, a lot of times, whatever we're doing, it's very difficult to define or to, to actually use in the existing genre. So I feel like the, the method is probably involved, how do you define a, a new genre in the in our creation? But, yeah, so I think for me, queer methods means two things. One is um, collaboration and working in queer community when possible. So a lot of my work involves collaboration with artists and academics and trying to build those bridges. But I think for me as an individual, it means working intimately with my material. Um, I think the thing that I really have a, a kind of material, almost erotic connection with is looking deeply at a game or a piece of media and getting kind of inside it mm -hmm. um, and learning from it in that way. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> Here's a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, this question is for John. Uh, I'm curious of what the inspiration was for the photograph of the crow. I'm 
I've been look, looking at um, a lot of um, simplest art and I'm so basically like drawing from the simplest movement. I'm, I think that kind of cross. I've also been racialized in terms of like kind of movies around what is in that kind of stuff. The Adam Crow mm -hmm. appears. I'm, I'm, there's a crow in the crows in terms of a Hitchcock movie. Um, which is also one of my favorite films. And so once again, I and it's just just pull, pulling from into how the crowd being represented, and but kind of also then trying to create this kind of human, non-human thing. Mm -hmm. And but also, and eggs play a, a cue into the birth and so on. So forth. and so really, I'm just drawing remixing it and then just throwing it back out there and then just see what happens. It, it, because I sometimes for me part of the creative process some, and then I just oh my god I saw one night as well I, I just like crossed my fucking head all night I'm like what is it about fucking crow? <laughs> crow is, is not kind of my animal so I was like, I just like an image of crows and then call the friend saying, okay. <laughs> I was image in my head because then that's it. And there's times when images just come in your head and they don't know why. And so then, once again, I've just got to kind of almost create it if possible. Mm -hmm. and, and so I am, that's why there's a crow image. And then also then, over the last few years, I've been using, I mean, like that crow, well, there's the, the crow mark, I've got snakes now up here, octopuses. I've been now picked just because I'm just trying to somehow move between this, this human, non human type of space. I'm with the image around the black queer body. Yeah. I guess it was the acts that really intrigued me because for some reason, immediately the one thing that came to mind was Tony Morris and his tar baby. And uh, the, mis uh, the mystical woman uh, in yellow. That would carry eggs and was holding kind of the potential for what yes. should be the way forward. Yes. That should yeah. be. Yeah. And you know, and then Jadine is like the heathen, you know, who yeah. goes to, you know, Paris yeah. and becomes model. Right? Yeah. And thinking about that juxtaposition yeah. of yeah. the black queer body holding eggs. Yes, yes. Be. And then the and then image with the uh, Corba snake also, if you look at lots of images from the 50th century onwards, I would know Mary, Queen and Jesus, once again. Mm -hmm. I, I, a lot of my work draws upon an artistic history, photographic history, as well as, once again, they swear of just, just playing around with a lot of these paintings that I also love as well. And so once again, the suckling on the breast, there's a whole history that it pulls upon, and they just kind of flip it and just see what happens. So yeah, that's that one, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you everyone for all the presentations. I love that you all sort of work with different mediums. Uh, and a lot of them are interactive, right? As you were saying, like, you kind of feed these things. Uh, and so with me, my question is, um, like, do you ever find new feelings in any of your bodies of, of transness or queerness that comes from those interactive moments with those particular mediums that you're working with? Uh, and that's for, for anyone who wants to uh, take up with you. What's the question? <laughs> um, yeah, if you ever... Do so, want to restate the question again? Sorry? So, sorry, just yeah, restate the question again. Yeah, yeah, if you ever... The feeling is the only medium. Yeah, if you ever kind of feel like some sort of queer, interactive moment with your medium that maybe materializes in your body and you kind of take with you afterwards, uh, like you kind of learn something new about yourself or you learn something new about queerness uh, that just kind of like felt in your body from creating these pieces or working with okay. these pieces. I'm, I think for me, I'm, I, try, I try not to name that encounter as a queer encounter mm -hmm. because then I think the danger is to attach one's emotions or feelings to this thing. So then once again, and for me, it's just what I'm feeling, I'm feeling, but, but, but attach it to certain things in some cases, you are trying to kind of make sense of it, and then I'm not always sure that you can make sense of the creative process or or being in the process because I think that the process also does what it does, and then there's a danger of attaching it to some of these ideas that that's also quite clunky. Mm -hmm. So 
and I'm not sure if it's like it's the cost of God, but I try not to always name it, always not this is the queer moment. I'm making love to my lover, this is the queer moment. It doesn't quite work that way for me. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then, uh, Adu, you, you did talk about uh, uh, in the dark room when working with the chemical. Yes. Yeah. I think you, you talk about you, know, you talk about about the materialism, yeah. and that's probably uh, you know I always think uh, like medium as the medium, right? It's, it's just in between thing as as the way you uh, you you get in the next step. So uh, and and you actually particularly focus on the materialism and. Uh, but for example, for us, we probably, you know, the way we think about media was like, which you know, which software we gonna use, <laughs> which update, right? Uh, which version, you know, like which version? No, okay, the version has gone up to ten point zero. You know, I'm still on eight point zero. You know, that kind of question. So it's a, it, it, it's. This urgency about like need to be updated. Do you feel that way sometimes? Okay, can we actually refuse to be updated? <laughs> can I still stay up version one point zero? Yeah, but I still believe that there is still an intimate relationship even with data. Yes. After that, what's the actual intimacy is not put put to one side. It's still there. I think that people don't talk about it. Yeah. Because of that relational. Aspect of even working with not even with the but you know, working with technology or data, there's still something that's still happening. I mean, or maybe we cannot articulate it yet, but there's still that intimacy and with one's medium, there's intimacy with one thinking. There's some this kind of material aspect to it all. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for me, orgasm is totally data. I've been dealing with orgasm data since 2000. So. <laughs> and it's, it's recyclable, so which is good. Uh, yeah, in, in uh, oceanic, I mean, I'm thinking more about queer and trans ecology. So, um, like in oceanic and in my new book, thinking about, um, you know, the world is trans. You, like, you know, it's fucking trans is a starfish. So cut off their arm and it grows back. That's <laughs> <laughs> super trans. <laughs> and, you know, in um, film, we're talking about shoals, because uh, Tiffany King writes about them, right? So these, like, sand or rock formations off the shore that are, like, they're not necessarily shore or ocean. They're somewhere in between. And they're, like, moving bodies that colonists and cartographers couldn't map, so they would just mess up the colonist ship. Um, that's a lot what we're thinking about here. Or like the kelp body on the forest, like this huge mass of kelp. Um, what is that thing? Gender? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but we're also pointing to the loss of kelp because 95% of the kelp in North California is gone. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we're talking about the resistance of mass of kelp, um, <coughs> which causes some of the danger that we can feel as queer and trans I think that for me, one of the things that draws me to video games is it's through games that I feel like I can inhabit a trans self and a queer self in ways that's hard for me in real life. And often that is not through a kind of um, literal representation of those identities, but through moments of play, of things that are strange or non-human or move in certain things like octopuses or pieces of toast right, that have a hard time navigating worlds because it feels to me like it um, more accurately and in some weird way more comfortably represents what it feels like to me as a person who doesn't fit in a lot of ways to try and move through this world. We have time in for one more question. Yeah. Sure, thanks. Uh, one statement is the, um, the notion of a dildo gun is something that I'm really still processing. Like that <laughs> I do know what? Your gun with oh, the, I'm just processing that it is for me. <laughs> The notion of it and the idea of taking a bullet for someone has I've totally changed my opinion on that. But my question is this it's actually more about queer identity. Like when you're talking about erasure and de identification in order to create a trans identity through your game, and you're talking about bridges and erosion and how these erosions of the bridges, and I'm wondering somewhere if this. It, it's coming across to me that trans identity is sort of always going to be this liminal space, mm -hmm. that there's no solidity in it, and that the world that through gaming and literature and film and 
um, and through visual art, are trying to create sort of something static that seems to be very fluid and almost ephemeral. And I'm wondering, do you, do you feel that, do any of you feel that a trans identity is ever going to be something that as an individual people can come to terms with and exist in one comfortable space, or is it always just going to be shifting and changing and amorphous in a way that it will never really be able to just feel comfortable? I don't know if I have to answer that. Um, I know I've played it. I feel like I mean, it's I'm so really different. fucking comfortable with my vagina. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of possibility for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, certainly we could point to a kind of transnormativity. Like, certainly that's the point of. Transformativity, right? It's like, oh, there's we put trans people on TV shows and magazine covers, then we get to say who are the trans people that are worthy of surviving and being on those mm -hmm. magazine covers, and who are the people that are not. Um, but my hope is for a continued fugitivity of transness mm -hmm. that can continue to evolve and be ungovernable and unmeaningful. Like my students, I said jokingly to somebody here, I think I have tr trans women in my class this quarter. They're also fucking non-binary. I don't really even know. <laughs> like look at them and hear their pronouns, names, and, and see them, and I'm still like, I have no idea what your gender identity is. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just want to mention, like for example, uh, when I was making Brenton, so this is the '90s, so I, I actually was uh, traveling quite a bit and you know working with the trans community, uh, and at the time I feel. Uh, Throughout the nineties, you know, it was the, so important to be passing. Yeah, the, the whole thing about passing. If you pass, if you could be kind of accepted uh, into the, the normal world, and you know, how do you kind of not reveal yourself? So you know, the world has come to these the non-binary now, the late uh, generation. So uh, for me, it's good. It's a, it's a, you know, it, it, it's amazing, you know, like to, to think about this whole processing, uh, you know, transition processing. It's no good. I, I don't feel bad about being in between, or, you know, uh, gender in between, or anything in between. So, um, I think we have come to the end of our time. I just want to thank all of you so much for coming.